It was the first day of spring. Jane and Michael knew this at once because they heard Mr. Banks singing in his bar. And there was only one day of the year when he did that. Hello, the parrot tulips are in bud. He went into the garden and sniffed the air. Mm. Winds in the west, I think. He looked down towards Admiral Boom's house where the telescope weathercock swung. I thought so. Westerly weather. Bright and balmy. I won't take it over there. And with that, he picked up his bag and his bowler hat and hurried away to the city. Did you hear what he said? The wind's in the west. Neither of them said any more, but there was a thought in each of their minds that they wished was not there. They forgot it soon, however, for everything seemed to be as it always was, and the spring sunlight lit up the house so beautifully that nobody remembered it needed a coat of paint and new wallpapers. On the contrary, they found themselves thinking that it was the best house in Cherry Tree Lane. But trouble began after luncheon. Jane had gone down to dig in the garden. She had just sown a row of radish seed when she heard a great commotion in the nursery and the sound of hurrying footsteps on the stairs. Look, Jane, look! Michael held out his hand. Within it lay Mary Poppins' compass, with the disc frantically swinging around the arrow as it trembled. The compass? She gave it to me. She said I could have it all for myself now. Uh-oh. There must be something wrong. What is going to happen? She's never given me anything before. Perhaps she was only being nice. In her heart, she felt as disturbed as Michael was. She knew very well that Mary Poppins never wasted time in being nice. And yet, strange to say, during that afternoon, Mary Poppins never said a cross word. Indeed, she hardly said a word at all. She seemed to be thinking very deeply. And when they asked questions, she answered them in a faraway voice. At last, Michael could bear it no longer. Oh, do be cross, Mary Poppins. Do be cross again. It's not like you. Oh, I feel so anxious. Trouble, trouble, and it will trouble you. Immediately, he felt a little better. Perhaps it's only a feeling. Perhaps everything is all right, and I'm just imagining. Don't you think so, Jane? Probably. The wind grew wilder towards evening and blew in little gusts about the house. It went pulling and whistling down the chimneys, slipping in through the cracks under the windows, turning the nursery carpet up at the corners. Mary Poppins gave them their supper and cleared away the things, stacking them neatly and methodically. Then she tidied up the nursery and put the kettle on the hob. There. Now I'm just going to take the shoes down for Robertson to clean. Behave yourselves, please, till I come back. She went out and shut the door quietly behind her. How silly we are. Everything is all right. listened. Then they ran quickly to the window and looked out. Down below, just outside the front door, stood Mary Poppins, dressed in her coat and hat, with her carpet bag in one hand and her umbrella in the other. The wind was blowing wildly about her, tugging at her skirt, tilting her hat rakishly to one side, but it seemed to Jane and Michael that she did not mind, for she smiled as though she and the wind understood each other. She paused for a moment on the step and glanced back towards the front door. Then with a quick movement, she opened the umbrella, though it was not raining, and thrust it over her head. The wind, with a wild cry, slipped under the umbrella, pressing it upwards as though trying to force it out of Mary Poppins' hand. But she held on tightly, and that apparently was what the wind wanted her to do. For presently, it lifted the umbrella higher into the air and Mary Poppins from the ground. It carried her lightly so that her toes just grazed along the garden path. Then it lifted her over the front gate and swept her upwards towards the branches of the cherry trees in the lane. She's going, Jane, she's going. Quick, let us get the twins. They must be the last of her. She had no doubt now, nor had Michael, that Mary Poppins had gone for good because the wind had changed. 
They each seized a twin and rushed back to the window. Mary Poppins was in the upper air now, floating away over the cherry trees and the roofs of the houses, holding tightly to the umbrella with one hand and to the carpet bag with the other. Mary Poppins! Mary Poppins, come back! But she either did not hear or deliberately took no notice. For she went sailing on and on, up into the cloudy, whistling air, till at last she was wafted away over the hill and the children could see nothing but the trees bending and moaning under the wild west wind. She did what she said she would anyway. She stayed till the wind changed. I wonder if we'll ever see her again. Children! Children! Oh, children, I am very cross. Mary Poppins has left us. Yes. yes. You knew then. It's outrageous. One minute here and gone the next, not even an apology. She simply said, I'm going. And off she went. Anything more, preposterous more, thoughtless more, discourteous. What is it, Michael? Did she say she'd come back? Tell me, did she? I certainly shan't have her back even if she does want to come. Leaving me high and dry with nobody to help me and without a word of notice. Oh, Mother. You're a very cruel woman. Children, I'm ashamed of you. Really, I am. To want back anybody who has treated your mother so badly, I, I, I'm utterly shocked. Jane burst into tears. <laughs> Mary Poppins is the only person I want in the world. Oh, really, children, really. I, I don't understand you. Oh, do be good, I beg of you. There's nobody to look after you tonight. I have to go out to dinner. And it's Ellen's day off. I, I shall have to send Mrs. Brill up. And she kissed them absent-mindedly and went away with an anxious little line on her forehead. Well, I never did. Her going away and leaving you poor dear children in the lurch like that. A heart of stone, that's what that girl had, and no mistake. Or my name's not Clara Brill. Always keeping herself to herself. And not even a lace handkerchief or a hatpin to remember her by. Will you get up, please, Master Michael? How he stood us along, I don't know, with her airs and graces and all. Cool, what a lot of buttons, Miss Jane. Stand still now and let me undress you, Master Michael. Plain she was, too. Nothing much to look at. Indeed, all things considered, I don't know that we won't be better off after all. Now, Miss Jane, where's your nightgown? Oh, what's this under your pillow? Mrs. Brill had drawn out a small, knobbly parcel. What is it? Give it to me, give it! Trembling with excitement, she took it from Mrs. Brill's hands very quickly. Michael came and stood near her and watched her undo its string and tear away the brown paper. It's her picture! And it was. Inside, in a little curly frame, was a painting of Mary Poppins. And underneath it was written, Mary Poppins by Bert. That's the match man. He did it. Jane found suddenly that there was a letter attached to the painting. She unfolded it carefully. It ran, Dear Jane, Michael had to come to us, so the picture is for you. Au revoir, Mary Poppins. Mrs. Brill, what does au revoir mean? Au revoir, dearie. Why, doesn't it mean, uh, let me see. I'm not much up in these foreign tongues. Doesn't it mean, God bless you? No, no, I'm wrong. I think, Miss Jane, dear, it means to meet again. That's all right, then. You always does what she says she will. Michael, are you crying? No, I'm not. It's only my eyes. She pushed him gently towards his bed. And as he got in, she slipped the portrait of Mary Poppins into his hand, hurriedly in case she should regret it. You have it for tonight, darling. Then she tucked him in, just as Mary Poppins used to do.
I won't stand it. I simply will not stand any more. What is it? And what is it that you are kicking up and down in the hall? My hat. My best bowler hat. Well, is there anything wrong with it? Look and see. Trembling, Mrs. Banks stooped and picked up the hat. It was covered with large, shiny, sticky patches. And she noticed that it had a peculiar smell. It smells like boot polish. It is boot polish. Robinson brushed my hat with a boot brush. In fact, he has polished it. I don't know what's come over this house. Nothing ever goes right. Hasn't for ages. Shaving water too hot, breakfast coffee too cold. And now this. He snatched the hat from Mrs. Banks and caught up his bag. I am going, and I don't know that I shall ever come back. I shall probably take a long sea voyage. Oh, dear. It's quite true. Nothing does go right nowadays. Ever since Mary Poppins left without a word of warning, everything has gone wrong. <laughs> she sat down at the foot of the stairs and took out her handkerchief and cried into it. And as she cried, she thought of all that had happened since that day when Mary Poppins had so suddenly and so strangely disappeared. Nurse Green had arrived soon after, and had left at the end of the week because Michael had spat at her. She was followed by Nurse Brown, who went for a walk one day and never came back. And it was not until later that they discovered that all the silver spoons had gone with her. And after Nurse Brown came Miss Quigley, the governess, who had been asked to leave because she played scales for three hours every morning before breakfast. And Mr. Banks did not care for music. And then there was Jane's attack of the measles, and the bathroom geezer bursting, and the cherry trees ruined by the frost. If and you the... please, Mum. Mrs. Banks looked up to find Mrs. Brill, the cook, at her side. The kitchen flue's on fire. Oh, dear, what next? Between them, they managed to put out the fire. But that was not the end of Mrs. Banks' troubles. What is it now? Oh, me leg, me leg. <laughs> it was Ellen, the housemaid. She sat on the stairs, surrounded by a ring of broken china, groaning loudly. Oh! oh what is the matter with it? Broken! Oh, nonsense, Ellen. You sprained your ankle, that's all. My leg is broken! Oh, what shall I do? <laughs> the shrill cries of the twins sounded in the nursery. They were fighting for the possession of a blue celluloid duck. And Jane and Michael, who were painting pictures on the nursery wall, were arguing as to whether a green horse should have a purple or a red tail. This is the last straw! She helped Ellen to bed and put a cold water bandage around her ankle. Then she went up to the nursery. It should have a red tail, shouldn't it? Oh, Mother, don't let him be so stupid. Well, what horse is a purple tail? Children, children, be quiet or I shall go mad! There was silence for a moment as they stared at her with interest. Would she really, they wondered? And what would she be like if she did? Now, I will not have this behaviour. Poor Ellen has hurt her ankle, and so there is nobody to look after you. You must all go to the park and play there until tea time. Jane and Michael, you must look after the little ones. Michael, you may take your new kite. Now get your hats, all of you. Why must we go to the park? There's nothing to do there. Because I must have peace. And if you will go quietly and be good children, there will be coconut cakes for tea. Jane had pushed the perambulator as far as the lake. Now give me the duck. Michael, what are we to do with them? If we give the duck to them, they'll fight over it. And if we don't, they'll go on crying. I'll fly the kite for them. Look, children, look! He held up the beautiful green and yellow kite and began to unwind the string. The twins eyed it tearfully and without interest. He lifted the kite high above his head and ran a little way. It flapped in the air for a moment and then collapsed hollowly on the grass. Try again. You hold it up while I run. This time, the kite rose a little higher. But as it floated, its long, tasseled tail caught in the branches of a lime tree, 
and the kite dangled limply among the leaves. Oh, dear. Nothing goes right nowadays. Hello, hello, hello. What's all this? They turned and saw the park keeper looking very smart in his uniform and peaked cap. He was prodding up stray pieces of paper with the sharp end of his walking stick. Well, we don't allow litter here, you know, not on the ground or in the trees, neither. This won't do at all. It isn't litter, it's a kite. A kite? Yes, so it is. And I haven't flown a kite since I was a boy. He sprang up into the tree and came down holding the kite tenderly under his arm. Now, we'll wind her up and give her a run and away she'll go. Thank you, but I want to fly the kite myself. Oh, yeah, but you get me help, won't you? Seeing as I've got it down and I haven't flown a kite since I was a boy. All right. Oh, thank you, thank you. Now, now then, I take the kite and walk ten paces down the green, and when I say go, you run. See? Eight, nine, ten. He turned and raised the kite above his head. Go! Michael began to run. There was a tug at the string, as the winding stick turned in his hand. She's afloat! Michael looked back. The kite was sailing through the air, plunging steadily upwards. Higher and higher it dived, a tiny wisp of green and yellow bounding away into the blue. The keeper's eyes were popping. I never saw such a kite, not even when I was a boy. A light cloud came up over the sun and puffed across the sky coming towards the kite. Up and up went the tossing tail darting through the air until it seemed but a faint dark speck on the sky. The cloud moved slowly towards it. Nearer, nearer. Gone! The speck disappeared behind the thin grey screen. The twins sat quietly in the perambulator. A curious stillness was upon them all. The taut string running up from Michael's hand seemed to link them all to the cloud and the earth to the sky. They waited, holding their breaths for the kite to appear again. Suddenly, Jane could bear it no longer. Michael, pull it in, pull it in. Michael turned the stick and gave a long, strong pull. The string remained taut and steady. He pulled again, puffing and panting. I can't, it won't come. I'll help now. Pull! Let, let me. Now, when I was a boy, we did it this way. Now, now all together. Pull! It's coming! Suddenly, the string slackened, and a small, whirling shape shot through the grey cloud and came floating down. Wind her up! But the string was already winding round the stick of its own accord. Down, down came the kite, turning over and over in the air, dancing wildly at the end of the jerking string. Something's happened. That's not our kite. That's quite a different one. They stared. It was quite true. The kite was no longer green and yellow. It had turned colour and was now navy blue. Down it came, tossing and bounding. Suddenly... Michael gave a shout. Jane, Jane, it isn't a kite at all. It looks like, oh, it looks like. Why, Michael, why, quickly, I can hardly wait. For now, above the tallest trees, the shape at the end of the string was clearly visible. There was no sign of the green and yellow kite, but in its place danced a figure that seemed at once strange and familiar. A figure wearing a blue coat with silver buttons and a straw hat trimmed with daisies. Tucked under its arm was an umbrella with a parrot's head for a handle. A brown carpet bag dangled from one hand while the other held firmly to the end of the shortening string. Ah, oh, it is her! I knew it! On sailed the curious figure, its feet neatly clearing the tops of the trees. They could see the face now, and the well-known features. Coal-black hair, bright blue eyes, 
a nose that turned upwards like the nose of a Dutch doll. As the last length of string wound itself around the stick, the figure drifted down between the lime trees and alighted primly on the grass. Mary Poppins! Mary Poppins! At last! At last! At last! We knew you'd come back. We found the letter that said, Orothor. A satisfied smile spread for a moment over Mary Poppins' face. Up from the mouth, over the turned up nose, into the blue eyes. But it died swiftly away. I'll thank you to remember that this is a public park and not a bear garden. Such goings on, I might as well be at the zoo. And where, may I ask, are your gloves? Hm, put them on, please. And slinging her carpet bag over the handle of the perambulator, she began to push the twins toward the gate. Uh, you look, you see here, uh, I'm not sure to report this. It's, uh, it's against the regulations. Coming down into the sky like that... Where from, I'd like to know. Where from? If I was a park keeper, I should put on my cap and button my coat. Excuse me. Blushing, the keeper bent to pick up his hat. When he looked up again, Mary Poppins and the children had disappeared through the gate of number 17, Cherry Tree Lane. Why, it's Mary Poppins. Where did you come from, out of the blue? Yes, she came down on the end of... He stopped short. Mary Poppins had fixed him with one of her terrible looks. I found them in the park, ma'am, so I brought them home. Uh, have you come to stay, then? For the present, ma'am. But, uh, Mary Poppins, last time you were here, you left without a word of warning. How do I know that you won't do it again? You don't, ma'am. But, uh, uh, will you, do you think? I couldn't say, ma'am, I'm sure. Oh. And before she had recovered from her surprise, Mary Poppins had taken her carpet bag and was hurrying the children upstairs. She took off her overcoat, she hung it on a hook behind the night nursery door, then she removed her hat and placed it neatly on one of the bedposts. Everything about her was just as it had always been. They could hardly believe she'd ever been away. Mary Poppins bent down and opened the carpet bag. It was quite empty except for a large thermometer. What's that for? You. But I'm not ill. It's two months since I had measles. Open. Jane shut her eyes very quickly and opened her mouth. The thermometer slipped in. I want to know how you've been behaving since I went away. Then she took out the thermometer and held it up to the light. Careless, thoughtless and untidy. I'm not surprised. She thrust the thermometer into Michael's mouth. He kept his lips tightly pressed upon it until she plucked it out and read, A very noisy, mischievous, troublesome little boy. I'm not! For answer, she thrust the thermometer under his nose and he spelt out the large red letters. A very noisy... You see? She opened John's mouth and popped in the thermometer. Peevish and excitable. And when Barbara's was taken... Mary Poppins read out the two words. Thoroughly spoiled. <laughs> it's about time I came back. Then she popped it quickly into her own mouth, left it there for a moment, and took it out. A very excellent and worthy person, thoroughly reliable in every particular. <laughs> I thought so. Now, tea in bed. It seemed to them no more than a minute before they had drunk their milk and eaten their coconut cakes and were in and out of the bath. As usual, everything Mary Poppins did had the speed of electricity. Hooks and eyes rushed apart, buttons darted eagerly out of their holes, sponge and soap ran up and down like lightning, and towels dried with one rub. Mary Poppins walked along the row of beds, tucking them all in. When she came to Michael's bed, she bent down and rummaged under it for a minute. Then she carefully drew out her camp bedstead with all her possessions laid upon it in neat piles. The cake of sunlight soap, the toothbrush, the packet of hairpins, the bottle of scent, the small folding armchair, and the box of throat lozenges. Also, the seven flannel nightgowns, the four cotton ones, the boots, the dominoes, the two bathing caps, and the postcard album. Where did they come from? I've been under my bed simply hundreds of times, and I know they weren't there before. Mary Poppins did not reply. She'd begun to undress. Jane and Michael exchanged glances. 
They knew it was no good asking because Mary Poppins never explained anything. Oh, Mary Poppins, it's just been awful without you. You've been awful, that's more like it. This house is nothing but a bear garden. I wonder anyone stays in it. But you will, won't you? We'll be as good as gold if only you'll stay. She looked from one to the other calmly, seeing right down inside their hearts and understanding everything. I'll stay. I'll stay till the door opens. And as she spoke, she gazed thoughtfully at the door of the nursery. Oh, don't say that, Mary Poppins. That door is always opening. I meant the other door. What can she mean? I know what she means. There isn't any other door. And a door that isn't there can't open. So she's going to stay forever. <laughs> a nice life I'd have if I spent all my days with you. They curled up in their beds and lay watching Mary Poppins as she moved mysteriously beneath the tent of her nightgown. And they thought of her first arrival at Cherry Tree Lane and all the strange, astonishing things that had happened afterwards of how she had flown away on her umbrella when the wind changed, of the long, weary days without her, and of the marvellous descent from the sky this afternoon. Suddenly, Michael remembered something. My kite! I forgot all about it. Where's my kite? Kite? Which kite? What kite? My green and yellow kite with the tassels. The one you came down on at the end of the string. Did I understand you to say that that I came down from somewhere on the end of a string. But you did, today, out of a cloud. We saw you. Me, Michael Banks. Your manners have not improved since I went away. On the end of a string, indeed. I have never been so insulted in my life. Never. With a furious sweep of her arm, she turned down her bed and flounced into it, pulling the blankets right over her head. She did, though, didn't she? We saw her. But Jane did not answer. Instead, she pointed towards the night nursery door. Michael lifted his head cautiously. Behind the door, on the hook, hung Mary Poppins' overcoat, its silver buttons gleaming in the glow of the nightlight. And dangling from the pocket were a row of paper tassels, the tassels of the green and yellow kite. They gazed at it for a long time. Then they nodded across to each other. They knew there was nothing to be said. For there were things about Mary Poppins they would never understand. But she was back again. That was all that mattered. day long Mary Poppins had been in a hurry and when she was in a hurry she was always cross. Jane and Michael kept out of her way as much as possible for they knew that there were times when it was better not to be seen or heard by Mary Poppins. I wish we were invisible. We shall be if we go behind the sofa. We can count the money in our money boxes and she may be better after she's had her supper. So they did that. Six, four, that's Ten, four, and three, that's all. That'll do nicely for the poor box. Oh, no, it's for myself. I'm saving. <laughs> for one of those airy planes, I suppose. No, for an elephant, a private one for myself, like Lizzie at the zoo. I could take you for rides, then. <laughs> what an idea. But they could see that she was not quite so cross as before. I wonder what happens in the zoo at night, when everybody's gone home. Care killed a cat. I wasn't caring. I was only wondering. Do you know? One more question from you and split spot to bed you go. And she began to tidy the nursery so busily that she looked more like a whirlwind in a cap and apron than a human being. It's no good asking her. She knows everything, but she never tells. What's the good of knowing if you don't tell anyone? Jane and Michael could never remember having been put to bed so quickly as they were that night. Mary Poppins blew out the light very early and went away as hurriedly as though all the winds of the world were blowing behind her. It seemed to them that they had been there no time, however, 
when they heard a low voice whispering at the door. Hurry, Jane and Michael. Get some things on and hurry. They jumped out of their beds, surprised and startled. Come on, something's happening. Hurry. Oh dear, all I can find is my sailor and a pair of gloves. Those will do. Put them on. It isn't cold. Come on. There was nobody there. But they seemed to hear something hurry away down the stairs. They followed. Whatever it was, or whoever it was, kept continually in front of them. Presently they were in the lane, their slippers making a soft, hissing noise on the pavement as they scurried along. Hurry. They began to run, hand in hand, following the voice down streets, through alleyways, under arches and across parks, until, panting and breathless, they were brought to a standstill beside a large turnstile in a wall. Here you are. Where? Look, don't you see where we are? It's the zoo. A very bright full moon was shining in the sky, and by its light Michael examined the iron grating and looked through the bars. Of course! How silly of him not to have known! It was the zoo. But how shall we get in? We've no money. Oh, <laughs> that's all right. Special visitors allowed in free tonight. Push the wheel, please. Now, here's your ticket. Looking up, they saw a huge brown bear who was wearing a coat with brass buttons and a peak cap on his head. In his paw were two pink tickets which he held out to the children. But we usually give tickets. Oh, usual is as usual does. Tonight you receive them. I remember you. I once gave you a tin of golden syrup. Oh, you did. And you forgot to take the lid off. Do you know I was more than ten days working at that lid? You'd be more careful in future. But why aren't you in your cage? Are you always out of sight? Oh, no. Only when the birthday falls on a full moon. Ah, but you must excuse me. I must attend to the gate. Jane and Michael holding their tickets, walked into the zoo grounds. In the light of the full moon, every tree and flower and shrub was visible, and they could see the houses and cages quite clearly. There seems to be a lot going on. And indeed there was. Animals were running about in all the paths, sometimes accompanied by birds and sometimes alone. Two wolves ran past the children, talking eagerly to a very tall stork who was tiptoeing between them with dainty, delicate movements. Jane and Michael distinctly caught the words birthday and full moon as they went by. In the distance, three camels were strolling along side by side, and not very far away, a beaver and an American vulture were deep in conversation, and they all seemed to the children to be discussing the same subject. Whose birthday is it, I wonder? But Jane was moving ahead, gazing at a very curious sight. Just by the elephant stand, a very large, very fat old gentleman was walking up and down on all fours, and on his back, on two small parallel seats, were eight monkeys going for a ride. Why? It's all upside down. The old gentleman gave her an angry look as he went past. Upside down? Certainly not! Gross insult. Oh, please, I didn't mean you, but the whole thing. On ordinary days, the animals carry human beings, and now there's a human being carrying the animals. That's what I meant. Jane took Michael's hand and moved onwards. They were startled when a voice, almost at their feet, hailed them. Oh, oh. Come on, you two. In you come. Let's see you die for a bit of orange peel that you don't want. Looking down, they saw that it came from a small black seal who was leering at them from a moonlit pool of water. Come on now, and see how you like it. But, but we can't swim. Oh, can't help that. You should have thought of that before. Nobody ever bothers to find out whether I can swim or not. <coughs> eh? <coughs> what? <coughs> What's that? <coughs> he spoke the last question to another seal who had emerged from the water. Who? <coughs> Speak up! <coughs> Jane caught the words, Special visitors, friends of... and then no more. 
Oh, beg pardon. Pleased to meet you. Beg pardon. And he held out his flipper and shook hands limply with them both. Oh, look where you're going, can't you? Something bumped into Jane. She turned quickly and gave a little frightened start as she beheld an enormous lion. The eyes of the lion brightened as he saw her. Oh, I say, I didn't know it was you. <clears throat> this place is so crowded tonight that I'm in such a hurry to see the human speed. I, I, I'm afraid I didn't look where I was going. Are you coming along? I wanted to miss it, you know. Perhaps you'd show us the way. She was a little uncertain of the lion, but he seemed kindly enough. And after all, everything is topsy-turvy tonight. Delighted. The lion offered her his arm. She took it, but to be on the safe side, she kept Michael beside her. He was such a round, fat little boy, and after all, she thought, lions are lions. <clears throat> Does my mane look nice? <laughs> I had it curled for the occasion. Very. But isn't it rather odd for a lion to care about such things? I saw it. What, my dear young lady? The lion, as you know, is the king of beasts. He has to remember his position, and I personally am not likely to forget it. I believe a lion should always look his best, no matter where he is. Um, <clears throat> this way. And with a graceful wave of his forepaw, he pointed towards the big cat house and ushered them in at the entrance. Jane and Michael caught their breaths at the sight that met their eyes. The great hall was thronged with animals. Some were leaning over the long bar that separated them from the cages, some were standing on the seats that rose in tiers opposite. There were panthers and leopards, wolves, tigers and antelopes, monkeys and hedgehogs, wombats, mountain goats and giraffes, and an enormous group composed entirely of kittiwakes and vultures. Splendid, isn't it? Just like the dear old jungle days. But come along, we must get good places. Gangway! Gangway! Presently, through a little clearing in the middle of the hall, they were able to get a glimpse of the cages. Why? They're full of human beings. And they were. In one cage, two large middle-aged gentlemen in top hats and striped trousers were prowling up and down, anxiously gazing through the bars as though they were waiting for something. Children of all shapes and sizes, from babies in long clothes upwards, were scrambling about in another cage. The animals outside regarded these with great interest, and some of them tried to make the babies laugh by thrusting their paws or their tails in through the bars. In a third cage, three elderly ladies in raincoats and galoshes were imprisoned. One of them was knitting, but the other two were standing near the bars shouting at the animals and poking at them with their umbrellas. Nasty brutes, go away, I want my tea. <laughs> Isn't she funny? Jane, look! Michael pointed to the cage at the end of the row. Isn't that Admiral Boom? And Admiral Boom it was. He was ramping up and down in his cage, coughing and blowing his nose and spluttering with rage. Oh, bless my gizzard! All hands to the pump! Learn hope! Eva away there! Oh, but how did they all get in there? Lost, or rather left behind. These are the people who've dawdled and been left inside when the gates were shut. We've got to put them somewhere, so we keep them here. He's dangerous, that one there. Nearly did for his keeper not long ago. No, 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 don't go near him. Stand back, please, stand back. Don't crush. Make way, please. Ah, now they're going to be fed. Here come the keepers. Four brown bears, each wearing a peaked cap, were trundling trolleys of food along the little corridor that separated the animals from the cages. Stand back there! They opened a small door in each cage and thrust the food through on pronged forks. Bottles of milk were being thrown to the babies, who made soft little grabs with their hands and clutched them greedily. Plates of thin bread and butter and wholemeal scones were provided for the ladies in galoshes, and the gentlemen in top hats had lamb cutlets and custard in glasses. These, as they received their food, took it away into a corner, 
spread handkerchiefs over their striped trousers and began to eat. Ah, lost my vitals. Call that a meal. Stupid little round of beef with a couple of cabbages. What? No Yorkshire pudding? Outrageous! Put with the anchor! Plague my pot! Pot, I say! Leave her over! Listen to him. <laughs> well, if you'll excuse me, I must be getting along. See you later at the Grand Chain, I hope. I'll look out for you. Leading them to the door, he took his leave of them, sidling away, swinging his curled mane, his golden body dappled with moonlight and shadow. Oh, please. I wanted to ask him if they'd ever get out. She turned to Michael, but found that he was no longer by her side. He had moved away along one of the paths, and running after him, she found him talking to a penguin who was standing in the middle of the path with a large copybook under one wing and an enormous pencil under the other. He was biting the end of it thoughtfully as she approached. Uh, perhaps you can tell me. Now, what rhymes with Mary? Hmm? I can't use contrary because that's been done before and one must be original. If you're going to say fairy, don't. I've thought of that already, but as it's not a bit like her, it won't do. Uh, Harry. Mm, yeah, it's not poetic enough. What about wary? Well, it's not very good, is it? I'm afraid I'll have to give it up. You see, I was trying to write a poem for the birthday. I thought it would be so nice if I began, Oh, Mary, Mary... And then I couldn't get any further. No, it's very annoying. They expect something learned from a penguin, and I don't want to disappoint them. Now, oh, come along, you two, come along. You want to pay your respects, I suppose, it being the birthday and all. Oh, of course. The brown bear put an arm around each of them and propelled them along the path. They could feel his warm, softy fur brushing against their bodies and hear the rumblings of his voice made in his stomach as he talked. Ah, here we are. Here we are. He stopped before a small house whose windows were all so brightly lit that if it hadn't been a moonlit night, you would have thought the sun was shining. The bear opened the door and gently pushed the two children through it. The light dazzled them at first, but their eyes soon became accustomed to it, and they saw that they were in the snake house. All the cages were open, and the snakes were out some curling lazily into great scaly knots, others slipping gently about the floor. And in the middle of the snakes, on a log that had evidently been brought from one of the cages, sat Mary Poppins. Jane and Michael could hardly believe their eyes. Couple of birthday guests, ma'am. The snakes turned their heads inquiringly towards the children. Mary Poppins did not move, but she spoke. And where's your overcoat, may I ask? And your hat and gloves? But before either of them had time to reply, there was a stir in the snake house. The snakes were rising on end and bowing to something behind Jane and Michael. The brown bear took off his peaked cap, and slowly Mary Poppins, too, stood up. My dear child, my very dear child. Out from the largest of the cages there came with slow, soft, winding movements a hammer dryad. He slid in graceful curves past the bowing snakes and the brown bear towards Mary Poppins. And when he reached her, he raised the front half of his long golden body and thrusting upwards his scaly golden hood, daintily kissed her, first on one cheek and then on the other. So this is very pleasant, very pleasant indeed. It is long since your birthday fell on the full moon, my dear. Be seated, friend. The other snakes slid reverently to the floor again, coiled themselves up, 
and gazed steadily at the Hamadryad and Mary Poppins. The Hamadryad turned then to Jane and Michael, and with a little shiver they saw that his face was smaller and more wizened than anything they had ever seen. They took a step forward, for his curious deep eyes seemed to draw them towards him. Long and narrow they were, with a dark, sleepy look in them, and in the middle of that dark sleepiness, a wakeful light, like a jewel. And who, may I ask, are these? Miss Jane Banks and Master Michael Banks at your service. Her friends. Ah, her friends. Then they are welcome. My dears, pray be seated. Jane and Michael drew their eyes from that compelling gaze and looked around for something to sit on. The brown bear provided this by squatting himself down and offering each of them a furry knee. He talks as though he were a great lord. He is. He's the lord of our world, the wisest and most terrible of us all. The hammered ryad smiled, a long, slow, secret smile, and turned to Mary Poppins. Cousin. Is she really his cousin? First cousin once removed on the mother's side. But listen now, he's going to give a birthday present. Cousin, it is long since your birthday fell on the full moon, and long since we have been able to celebrate the event as we celebrate it tonight. I have therefore had time to give the question of your birthday present some consideration, and I have decided that I cannot do better than give you one of my own skins. Indeed, cousin, it is too kind of you. Not at all, not at all. You know that I change my skin from time to time, and it may serve for a belt or a pair of shoes, even a hat band. These things always come in useful, you know. And with that, he began to sway gently from side to side. And it seemed to Jane and Michael, as they watched, that little waves were running up his body from the tail to the head. Suddenly, he gave a long, twisting, corkscrew leap, and his golden outer skin lay on the floor. And in its place, he was wearing a new coat of shining silver. Wait, I will write a greeting upon it. And he ran his tail very quickly along the throne skin, deftly bent the golden sheath into a circle, and diving his head through it as though it were a crown, offered it graciously to Mary Poppins. She took it, bowing. I just can't thank you enough. Don't try. He spread out his hood as though he were listening with it. Do I not hear the signal for the grand chain? Grand chain! Grand chain! Everybody to the centre for the grand chain and finale! Come along, come along, stand ready for the grand chain! I thought so. You must be off, my dear. They'll be waiting for you to take your place in the centre. Farewell till your next birthday. Hurry away. I will take care of your young friends. Jane and Michael felt the brown bear moving under them as they stood up. Past their feet they could feel all the snakes slipping and writhing as they hurried from the snake house. Mary Poppins bowed towards the hammer dryad very ceremoniously, and without a backward glance at the children, went running towards the huge green square in the centre of the zoo. Will you go with me? It has begun. And from the loud cries that were now coming from the green, the children could guess that he meant the grand chain. As they drew nearer, they could hear the animals singing and shouting, and presently they saw leopards and lions, beavers, camels, bears, cranes, antelopes, and many others all forming themselves into a ring around Mary Poppins. Then the animals began to move, 
wildly crying their jungle songs, prancing in and out of the ring, and exchanging hand and wing as they went. Oh, Mary, Mary, she's my dearie, she's my dearie, oh. The penguin came dancing by, waving his short wings and singing lustily. He caught sight of them, bowed to the hamadryad, and called out, I've got it. <laughs> Did you hear me singing it? It's not perfect, of course. Dearie does not rhyme exactly with Mary, but it'll do, it'll do. Jane and Michael watched the dance, the hamadryad secret and still between them. As their friend the lion dancing past bent down to take the wing of a Brazilian pheasant in his paw, Jane shyly tried to put her feelings into words. I thought, sir. Speak, my child. You thought? Well, uh, the lions and birds and tigers and little animals... You thought that they were all natural enemies, that the lion could not meet a bird without eating it nor the tiger the hare, eh? Ah, you may be right. It is probable. But not on the birthday. Tonight, the small are free from the great, and the great protect the small. Even I, even I can meet a barnacle goose without any thought of dinner on this occasion. And after all, it may be that to eat and be eaten are the same thing in the end. We are all made of the same stuff. We of the jungle and you of the city. The tree overhead and the stone beneath. The bird and the beast, the star, we are all one. All moving to the same end. Remember that when you no longer remember me, my child. But how can a tree be stone? A bird is not me. Jane is not a tiger. You think not. Look. And he nodded his head towards the moving mass of creatures before them. Birds and animals were now swaying together closely encircling Mary Poppins, who was rocking lightly from side to side. Backwards and forwards went the swaying crowd, keeping time together, swinging like the pendulum of a clock. Even the trees were bending and lifting gently, and the moon seemed to be rocking in the sky as a ship rocks on the sea. Bird and beast, Stone and star, we are all one, all one. Child and serpent, star and stone, all one. Jane and Michael, as they listened, felt themselves gently rocking too, or as if they were being rocked. Soft, shaded light fell on their faces. Asleep and dreaming, both of them. Was it the voice of the hammer dryad, or their mother's voice as she tucked them in on her usual nightly round of the nursery? Good. Was that the brown bear, gruffly speaking, or Mr. Banks? Jane and Michael, rocking and swaying, could not tell. Could not. I had such a strange dream last night. I dreamed we were at the zoo, and it was Mary Poppins' birthday. And instead of animals in the cages, there were human beings, and all the animals were outside. Why, that's my dream. I dreamed that too. We can't both have dreamed the same thing. Are you sure? Do you remember the lion who curled his mane and the seal who wanted us to... Dive for orange peel? Of course I do. And the babies inside the cage and the penguin who couldn't find a rhyme and the hammer dryer. Then it couldn't have been a dream after all. It must have been true. And if it was... Mary Poppins, could Michael and I have dreamed the same dream? You and your dreams, eat your porridge, please, or you will have no buttered toast. Mary Poppins... 
Were you at the zoo last night? At the zoo? Me at the zoo at night? Me a quiet, orderly person who knows what is what and what isn't. But where are you? I have no need of zoos. Thank you. Hyenas, orangutans, all of you. Sit up straight and no more nonsense. Then it must have been a dream after all. But Michael was staring open-mouthed at Mary Poppins, who was now making toast at the fire. Jane, Jane, look. He pointed, and Jane too saw what he was looking at. Round her waist, Mary Poppins was wearing a belt made of golden, scaly snake skin. And on it was written in curving, snaky writing, A present from the zoo.